Welcome to today's Network Book Forum, Spotlighting Democracy's Data by DNS alumni, Dr. Dan Bout. I'm Ronte Coppin, People and Culture Manager at Data and Society, here with Dr. Alex Hanna, Director of Research at the Distributed AI Research Institute there. I will be your host alongside my colleagues behind the curtain. So let's get started. Data and Society is an independent nonprofit research organization. We study the social implications of data-centric technologies and automation, producing original research that can ground informed evidence-based public debate. We believe that empirical evidence should directly inform the development and governance of new technology. Data and Society began in New York City an island node in a large network of hills, rivers, and mountains in the Atlantic Northeast known as Lenape Hokan, the ancestral land of the Leni Lenape people. Today, we are connected online via a different infrastructure, a vast array of servers, humans, and computers. In the United States, much of this system sits on stolen land acquired under the extractive logic of white settler expansion. As an organization, we recognize this history and uplift the sovereignty of indigenous people, data, and territory around the world. We commit to dismantling all ongoing settler colonial practices and their material implications on our digital worlds. The census isn't just a data collection process. It's a ritual and a tool of American democracy. Behind every neat grid of numbers, is a collage of messy human stories. You just have to know how to read them. In Democracy's data, the hidden stories in the US Census and how to read them, Dan Bout examines the 1940 US Census, uncovering what those numbers both condense and cleverly abstract. A universe of meaning and uncertainty, of cultural negotiation and political struggle. I'm very honored to introduce Dr. Dan Bout to say a few words about his book before I invite Dr. Alex Hanna to join our conversation. After that, we'll turn it over to you in the audience for a brief Q&A session. I encourage you to engage with us by adding your questions throughout the session and upvoting the ones that resonate most with you. Thank you so much for being here today, Dan. I'm really excited to hear you give your author remarks and walk us through the backstory of democracy's data, which I know will help to set the foundation for our later discussion. Please join me in welcoming Dan. Dan? Oh, thank you. Thank you. I can, I'm, I'm feeling the, the welcome uh, through the digital ether, and I really appreciate that. Um, Rante, thank you so much for agreeing to host this conversation. I'm really honored that you were willing to do this. Um, Alex, it's such a, a Pleasure to be able to talk about this book with you. Uh, and I really honored everyone else who's showing up here, who's either showing up right now with us in the real time, and those in the future who will show up with us in the digital replicated spaces and hang out with us, think with us. And I want to thank uh, Rigo for producing this, uh, Nazali for setting the groundwork. And I know there's a whole production team at Data and Society that makes these things so go so smoothly. I want to thank all of them too. Welcome uh, to this pre-book launch event, I'm happy to report that while uh, data, I'll get my, the title of my book proper, while democracy's data does not ship for two more weeks, it exists. And it is a really finely crafted object. I cannot wait for you all to get to hold it and smell it and of course read it. So, let's see if I can get the slides to work. There we go. One of the things that I think about a lot is the proper response to this slogan. Let the data decide. Do what the numbers dictate. It is a slogan that arises from the belief that the world would be better, fairer, if every choice was based on quantitative evidence and individual judgment was replaced as much as possible by explicit criteria. It is a slogan that accompanies the rise of predictive algorithms and machine learning. 
it's also a slogan with a much older, much for a, for a much older impulse than one might think. So let me tell you a story. I'll sketch one out for you. In 1940, 120,000 people set out, marched out, to count over 130 million of their neighbors. It was a staggering undertaking akin to mobilizing an army. It was often spoken of as something like mobilizing for war. Indeed, this army of enumerators generated then these figures that you're seeing on this table, these numbers, showing how many people lived in each state. In 1941, Congress used these numbers as required by the Constitution to apportion seats in the US House of Representatives and votes in the Electoral College to portion them amongst the various states. Congress also made it so that each future apportion, each one of these like splitting up of political power would happen automatically without its uh, explicit action. So for nearly a century now, letting the data decide has been a fixed principle in American democracy. Now the upshot of letting data decide was and is that seats swing seamlessly from state to state. Political fights about apportionment have moved out of Congress and into the courts. And I think most importantly, the entire legislative system has entered a period of profound stasis. In its early history, you can get a chance to sense of this by looking at this graph here from my friends at usapportionment.org. In its early history, when Congress and politics decided on the organization of the House, its membership grew steadily with population, albeit a bit more slowly. Now, the House is fixed at 435 seats for no particular reason. And as the country grows, the relationship of legislatures to those they represent grows ever more thin, distant. This is one consequence of letting the data decide. Democracy's data tells a story, actually I would say it tells many stories from many different vantage points of the 1940 census. Here's why. The 1940 census was a massive data set, still is, one that made fundamental decisions for American democracy and most importantly, all of the records from the 1940 census were available for close study. When I set out to write this book, those 1940 records were the most recent census records that I could investigate in full. A few months ago, or last April, that changed. The 1950 census records have been released. And indeed, I hope that many of my readers will one day take what they learn and go exploring for themselves in these new records. At any rate, the 1940 census offered me a unique opportunity to get to know the messy innards of a data set. One that was expected to drive, direct, or even automate governance. Now, in my research, I could look at archival documents showing people in charge trying to figure out how to get good data. Here, a bureau official named Cal Dietrich wrote to Milton Friedman. Yes, Milton Friedman, the famous conservative economist, complaining about people who didn't like the new census question about incomes. So Dietrich wrote, we are under extremely heavy fire because of the income question. I could also look at original census sheets filled out by enumerators in April 1940 or thereabouts. Now, these are a species of records that any of you who are genealogists or who've done any gene genealogical work are probably quite familiar with. So here's a record for Ray and Florence Dowd. Uh, now look to the far right-hand side. Um, I'm probably like a mirroring thing, so that's not the right-hand side. Look at your right-hand side of the screen. Uh, and you'll see that there's two zeros next to a 52 and next to an eight. And so that indicated that Ray and Florence Dowd claimed to have earned zero dollars in wages in the previous year while they worked for 52 weeks and eight weeks, respectively. Now, that could be true. Luckily, for the 1940 census, I could also frequently consult other records to read alongside the original data like this drawing, which was sent by Florence Dowd to a senator, in which she writes, I had these brass toes made just for such an occasion, as she imagines kicking an enumerator in the rear, out of the door. So 
maybe those income figures are not to be taken as entirely trustworthy. One consequence of examining the data closely is that we discover how messy it is. Okay. Here's an illustrated chapter outline of my book. It appears at the beginning of the book as well, if you want for when you all go and grab your copies. I'm, don't worry, I'm not gonna go take you through every single chapter here. Chapter one deals with people who designed the form itself and decided on questions and categories. And the final chapter considers the data as published and used by others. So these are the stages of data production that census studies usually focus on. So, I mean, great books like these, Deborah Thompson, Melissa Nobles, Ken Bruett, Paul Shore, those sorts of books. And of course, Margot Anderson, The American Census, which I have on a different bookshelf. But most of democracy's data instead thinks about the conversations that took place at millions of doorsteps as a nation of people from all over, identifying with many races and ethnicities in a stubbornly white supremacist system, as these whole complex individuals tried to make themselves known to their country. This process was filled with creativity and also conflict, with silences and errors, with pride and puzzlement. I think we need to spend more time in each data set's doorsteps. That is a project for which the usual suspects, the quantitatively skillful, are welcome. But we need the humanists, we need the genealogists, we need those who bring to the process a wide range of backgrounds, perspectives, and questions. There are stories in the data. We just have to learn how to read them. And when we do, we'll be in a better position to deal wisely with our data sets and to know how to trust them and how far to trust them. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. That was very insightful. Um, it was good to have that background um, and have you detail the process and decisions behind the chapters in democracy's data. And I wanna invite Alex into our conversation about the census. I'll start us off with this quote that I'm reading the book a few times now, um, I'd say is quite fundamental to the census story. And that is, to know America, each American had to submit to being known. Something that's quite um, integral in your documenting the census story is this idea of silences. So you make it a point, Dan, to distinguish between stories and numbers, as you just did. Um, so then how should we read for silences, the hidden? That is, how should one approach reading this data knowing that everything isn't actually captured? All right, Oof. I mean, reading for silences, I think is, is interesting. We have to distinguish the kinds of silences we're talking about because different kinds of silences will tell us different things. Um, there is a, there's one easy way to say that, to imagine the silence is necessarily a bad thing because it's missing. But I think maybe the baseline thing we need to say is that silences are necessary for communication. This is one of the, um, the kind of crucial concepts of a book called Silencing the Past, I mean, uh, Michel Trio, which is, I'm sure a lot of people here have read at some point, but it's both important to pay attention to silences where they come from, but to recognize that we can't say things, we can't study things, we cannot create data without choosing to make some things visible and making other things invisible. And so in that sense, like one reason we, we look at the silences of data set is because they tell us something about the values of a particular time, a particular society, the particular people who are behind, who are making the choice about what gets counted and what doesn't get counted. Um, I could, we could dig into a little, a little more, but I don't wanna to get too deep into the weeds. Um, I will say the one different kind of silence though are unintentional silences. And for a census, the most obvious kind of unintentional silence would be what we call an undercount. And in this case, um, what, I've, what I talk about in the book is how in the early 20th century, the discovery, the scientific discovery and quantification of the undercount of individuals in the census was led by black scholars first in the Census Bureau and then uh, particularly a scholar named Kelly Miller at 
uh, Howard University, who very aggressively in the 1920s put forward this claim that, and very insightfully put forward this set of claims that the 1920 census had undercounted African Americans. And uh, the Census Bureau at that point disputed quite vigorously that set of claims. Uh, but then by the middle of the 20th century, it came to be widely accepted that in fact there had been and continue to be persistent undercounts where some people just don't get counted by the census. Alex, do you want to jump in here and kind of talk about how you might see silences in your work um, engaging with the census? Yeah, absolutely. And just want to thank you all for inviting me um, and for the team to put this together. I'm super thankful and happy to be here. Uh, I love this question about silences because there's so many different silences that we can think of here. Um, and in the book, something that I love, love, love about this book is the way in which the stories in which the interactions are given flesh, given sinew, given blood, you can kind of see what kind of media these people may have interacted with or what they might have been thinking at the time, um, the ways in which people concerned about privacy were still <laughs> sending uh, drawings of um, kicking uh, a census enumerator out um, onto the doorstep. And the things that I, the things in which we're talking about and, and thinking about silences, um, silences suffuse all areas of the quote unquote data pipeline, right? Um, in the chapter on the people who create data sets, the, so, the quote unquote question men, you know, we have in this titans of industry who come here and are asking and are interested in, in asking about this contentious income question um, that don't have, you know, are, are, are less concerned and less thinking less about things that might be, uh, you know, previously uh, were of import to the Republic, things of, of uh, in terms of nationality and, and immigration. Um, and so silences are those of, of which, which are ass and which are of omission. Uh, some of the silences are um, embedded in the enumerator training process. Some of the enumerators um, go throughout and, and they collect some information, but they omit other information, either because the form, which is very, um, uh, has a constrained set of columns, can only fit so much, or um, by their own kind of predispositions of how they identify someone by race or ethnicity or uh, by gender. The, uh, the affordances given by the computers at the time, these this new technology of the punch card, uh, uh, you know, of literally these kinds of first digitizations, um, you know, can only encode so much, so much as well. So these silences, uh, uh, you know, occur at different different places, and and I think in modern um, discourse on on machine learning or data driven technologies, they sort of, uh, you know. Things that we may call silences in this view are sometimes all looped together in something called bias, uh, which I think does a lot <laughs> to obscure um, what is happening at each point and what is even the cause, whether that's intentional or, um, or technological or institutional, right? And so, um, I love this kind of thinking about how to read for silences and a kind of parallel of this um, work. Um, there's a paper that um, Morgan Klaus Showerman and, and Emily Denton and I wrote on data sets and computer vision and the way in which um, you know, we surveyed over a hundred different data sets and we're looking kind of what the values of the curators were in writing up these data sets and found huge silences and talking about how they treat care with regards to um, compared to speed or how they valued um, some kind of ideal of universality, whereas they eschewed this kind of concept of contextuality, which would give data sets possibly uh, a better kind of understanding in, 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 in the training and evaluation 
uh, these machine learning models. So um, these silences are, are a really interesting and I think important way of doing this type of data reading uh, in whatever the context. If I, if I can just piggyback one thing on that, um, I mean, two little things. One is I love that point about bias. I think it's really so interesting for, for historians um, and a lot of, probably a lot of people who do different types of cultural theory, right? Bias is such a strange word. I often talk with my students sometimes and I say, oh, I don't want you, to, don't talk about bias as a bad thing because like bias is the only thing we have. Like every source you read, bias is the worldview. Like it's our, it's our subject. It's not, we don't want to remove bias. Like it is, and yet at the same time, clearly bias, there's a good reason that bias has become so important to this, this sort of conversation. But the other thing I want to say is just about how silences are, especially at this, this doorstep data, what I call this doorstep data, the silences are, are hard to keep silent. And so like, for instance, um, th there's the story about this enumerator and uh, Alex got me thinking about this um, in Texas wandering around and because of a big politics, like politics at the international level, it's been decided that there can be no racial category called Mexican for 1940. But this enumerator wanders around in her district and she labels all kinds of people Mexican. Now that will be erased later on, but at this stage, Right. This is one of the interesting things is like, even though there might be silencing in a later part of the data, this is the data too at that moment of that enumeration. And we can see how like, how, how, pe how people are speaking and making judgments, making claims that might later be silenced if we only look at those numbers. Um, I'm glad you brought that up because I think for me too, in hearing you all talk, um, the silences is not just the census part, right? It's also in how we choose to answer the questions, we being now, but also <laughs> the people who actually filled it out in 1940 and onwards. And so I think something I wanted to raise, which I knew would come up, would be how people chose to tell the story of who they were. And so in that regard too, we could be silent in you know, how we say, how we're counseling kids or, you know, how we're uh, describing our race or our gender or any other uh, identity marker. So I wanted to throw that in there as another um, a thought for y'all to kind of riff off of about how it is that the people themselves kind of have a play in the silence. And either of y'all can start. <laughs> Maybe Alex, you can start. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is this what this is great in the sort of thinking about the stories we the stories we tell about ourselves. And I mean, starting with the starting with the um uh the way and in, in the book, uh, and this is just a plug for the book, there's such a there's such a um vividness in these individual stories of these people, uh of um uh, of this Dowd character, of, of this enumerator in Texas, of um, people uh, and, and what they're doing at what time. And I mean, and you do that yourself in, in, in the epilogue in, in a way that's that's very that's very sweet in, in thinking about this. And I I mean, I, I could even go about this thinking about, okay, if I'm going to fill out the census, as you right point, rightly point out, you know, Egyptians are to be counted as white and they're still, you know, to be counted uh, as white in the 2020 census and everybody from um, North Africa, uh, Middle East and North Africa. And, and there's some great scholars like uh, Neda Mahmoule who's, who's written about that as well and the kind of fight for that. And, and, and I'm a transgender woman and so sort of like over the years, my gender will have changed. Uh, and there's of course this kind of, um, these kinds of also this this body of research that focuses on how people's self perceptions also change depending on the stories they tell about themselves, right? Um, and so, the stories the stories of self, this idea of kind of you know where we are, and how we can fit in. It is you know stories of intentionality, but they're also stories of resistance, right? Um, there's this great story in the book about, you know, like this idea of um, Mexicans as, you know, a, a, and, and Mexican American uh, advocacy organizations encouraging people to classify themselves as white um, uh, to gain the same advantages of, of citizenship. Um, 
and then the and and then on the other side, um, um, you have people fighting against that and saying, "No, we're not way." <laughs> and it reminded me a lot of Netta's work actually in in this in her book. Um, uh, um, uh, oh gosh, uh, oh the blanking about the title of her book, <laughs> the limits, the limits to whiteness. Excuse me, and the in the in the first chapter, the limits to whiteness, she talks about these cases uh, in which um, Iranians. Uh, operate as what she calls as racial hinges, you know, the way in which their appeal, they make appeals, their appeals made to Iranians as both a foil by other groups saying that they're not like those Iranians, they're not like these Zor Zoroastrians, these, these pagans, though, you know, we're, we are actually uh, you know, we are actually white <laughs> um, compared to others um, uh, who 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 are say coming from South Asia who are making appeals and saying oh we're just like them they're they're Aryans and we are actually of this white or you know white group and so it's, so they operate in this kind of dualistic way and so much of it is a story of self and a story of our perceptions and as you rightly say and this major shift happens in 1977 with the oh, oh, um, Office of Management and Budget Directive. Um, that allows self-classification in, in, in terms to in terms to race and gender. And it's a function both of the stories of self, but also the kind of affordances that we have to squeeze into these, 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 uh, you know, these forms and these boxes and, and whatnot. And there's that tension there, uh, which I love you talk about in, 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 in the epilogue, which is the tension of wanting to, you know, be a good citizen of 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 uh, of gaining, you know, trying to um, have political power, but also that there is this inherent violence of misrecognition when we can't put ourselves into those those boxes. So I love that. I love you calling out that tension. I, I mean, this is the the thing that more than anything else has always drawn me in all of the work I do, which is. I, at one level, understand that our identities are very powerfully constructed by bureaucratic systems. They literally often give us the language and the terms with which we can organize ourselves and work with one another and see one another. And at the same time, our own senses of self, both because that points out, right, they change over time and because they're peculiar and situated so seldom actually work. Um, I mean, I think I read about, I've read about life insurance, I've written about the census now, and it's not because I like finance or bureaucracies. I think it's because they both like frighten me a great deal. And I, and I feel, they feel very foreign to me. And as a result, I spend a lot of time being fascinated by how it is that they actually work. Um, and I wanna spend some time like trying to understand these things that I understand are really powerful in my life. And to see like, how have people managed, like how have people gotten by in the midst of all of these really powerful forces? I love this. I, <laughs> I love that you study these things because they terrify you a bit. Like, it's great. It's, <laughs> yes, they also frighten me, insurance and the sort of these, these logics of, uh, uh, of data keeping and, and which technologies are get replicated from institution to institution. And, and I mean, yeah, I mean, there's something very um, brave about jumping <laughs> into these systems and instead of dealing with them, uh, you know, in a way that's that, that's head on and, and 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 trying to understand their internals. I'd like to jump in here because um, I feel like we're kind of heading in this direction. So let's just do it. Um, I feel like a good theme to talk about is data genealogies and governance, right? So there are all of these systems that we play into whether we want to or not. Um, <clears throat> and so I wanted to ask about how the census uh, serves a kind of infrastructural governance function. Uh, Dan, I'll let you kick off this one. Yeah, and I, yeah, no, you're right. Um, we, uh, Dante, we are totally going in this direction because I was even thinking as I, as I gave those comments I just gave, uh, I should say like these systems frighten and fascinate me uh, and 
I know that they're important and probably we can't have a mass society without them. So, uh, right, like I, I have pure ideals about insurance, like a good social insurance program in particular, I think is really, really important. Um, private insurance systems, I think are still very useful, even if um, prone to, to more difficulties. But as I say in the book, I believe in the census, uh, despite everything. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, but I say it in the same way that I believe in democracy, that I just, um, I don't, I, I'm sure there is a way, but I don't know the way to have a democracy without something like a census, without this kind of data system. Uh, because the premise, the ideal, we'll say the ideal has always been every person will be counted and then they will be represented in the government based on what, whether they're counted. And of course I have to specify that it's an ideal because for much of American history, huge swaths of individuals were not counted or were not counted fully by the census. Um, very explicitly, the Constitution did not count Native Americans. Uh, and, and there's a, a complicated story, which in 1940 has its own interesting story about how and why this, con this, this category of the Indian not taxed came to be removed from all census uh, calculations. Um, but then also very uh, crucially, enslaved people were, only, were counted as three fifths of a person, which has its own as a result of, of terrible compromises between um, states that were dominated by slavery and other states that also had slaves, it's important to say, at the time the compromise was made. Oh, yeah, so, so uh, all of which is to say, infrastructure, uh, you need for democracy, you, you do actually just need to count people. Uh, the census has in, in recent years, in the last kind of since 1940, it was really beginning to happen in 1940, come to take on all these other really powerful infrastructural powers as well, right? It was, it was for a long time used to shape congressional debates, but now Congress increasingly gives it power, which is one of the reasons the census has become so powerful, so contentious over the last 50 to 60 years, is that now, not only does it, um, does it shape people fighting over how to like draw district lines, which have to do with representation. But many laws automatically allocate, especially social funding to localities and to communities based on census data. And once you, once you let the data decide, it suddenly becomes the, the battleground itself. It becomes the place in which people have to fight because they're, to get them more money, to get their fair share, they have to fight over how they're, how they're being counted. And I would say, you know, the census place, I mean, it, it is maybe one of the, the paradigmatic infrastructural data sets, you know, it's it's since the longevity it has, um, that it's enshrined in the constitution, that it has this, that, that it carries that kind of heft, you know, and it's, and so it has such this, this, this I mean, it, it is, it is very entrenched in how we think about the social fabric. And it's kind of interesting because there's all there's there's data sets that have proliferated in the past, I don't know, half a century, um, even in the past 20 years that also take on this really infrastructural function, but they don't have the longevity of the institution and the different iterations of the data set, you know. Um, in a lot of my work, right, we discuss a bit about um about the infrastructural functions of, um, of some of the benchmark data that's used in machine learning. I saw Riga posted the, the uh, paper that um, we wrote for Logic Magazine. And there's another paper we wrote called Big, Bringing the People Back In that, that talks a little bit about the infrastructural function of benchmark data sets. But these data sets are, are pretty new. <laughs> Things like ImageNet have only been around for something like 12 years, um, maybe a little older. And so um, it's so, you know, and, and I think a lot of what you do in this book and, you know, and there's there's a part of this book that I just, I, I need to read because it just, I just have all kinds of arrows and things around it, <laughs> but it's about unsettling that infrastructure. And, uh, you know, of course it's, it's, it's taking a bit of cues from, from infrastructure studies, but it's this line we say, we need more investigations into data histories, not less. More people willing and, willing and able to read the stories behind the numbers. 
Um, you know, and, and that is just, it just really drives the point home that, you know, this, whatever this way, whatever, how authoritative these numbers or these data seem to be, we need more stories. We need more methods for unsettling that. And as you said at the top of the talk, leaving that merely to the, the quants and the mathematicians is not sufficient. Actually, you know, the kind of intervention, and I'll say this from my own work, the kind of intervention has had to been archival, ethnographic, textual in nature, um, because there's just a whole host of action and people and doorsteps, you know, whatever that doorstep can be conceptualized as that re that's really where um, the, I mean, I guess the shoe leather hits the concrete as it were. Yeah, no, I, I will, um, the way you're, you're putting that, Alex, that one, I guess one of the, one of my hopes with the book is that even if somebody in the end is like, you know what, I've really thought about it and I don't care about the 1940 census, uh, that they can, they can wander away from this book still having thoughts like, all right, this is a training ground where I can hone these skills that I can then take into the world to go and do these investigations in data sets that I think matter more to me at this particular moment. Um, so that's, so I am glad that you're seeing that too. That is certainly one of my hopes. And I will throw into the mix, um, just because I feel like Rigo needs more work, that um, Joanna Radin's Digital Natives, I know a piece that Alex and I uh, both love. It is, it is the one piece I always tell people is the, the kind of most important history of data piece that everyone needs to read. Um, and it is exemplary in this project of trying to explain why and how somebody needs to tell the story, the genealogy of a data set in order to understand what it means when we then just use it for stuff afterwards. As we're talking about how um, data con drives governance, over time, do you find that, um, either of you, do you find that the process has become more productive or less productive based on how the, census, the census has kind of changed? Or has it been pretty much on the same level? Dan, you can kick us off. Oh, yeah. Um... I mean, we, we, Alex earlier alluded to some of the really important things that have changed in the census over the years. Um, I'm gonna, I'll answer with a story. This is a story that a friend of mine gave me permission to share in the book. And I'm very uh, grateful to her for allowing me to do this. And it, cause it gives a sense of what happens when somebody encounters a census form. Uh, I mean, the first thing to say, the first clear thing to say in, is that folks today, anyone here who remembers taking the 2020 census, and most people don't remember it because it turns out it's not a very memorable experience, except for that moment where, in which you're frustrated because you're trying to like, you're being asked to do something that, you, that doesn't fit you. But then that even usually just goes away and you forget that you ever did it. But when people are filling out this 2020 census form, uh, they're only answering like seven questions. Whereas in 1940, they would have been facing like this big old sheet, like the size of a newspaper worth of questions. The other important distinction is that we generally, so 60% mm, or so of households fill it out directly online, on paper, something like that. And then lots of other folks, so that's why I had to catch myself, do in fact have an enumerator come to their door and ask questions of them and fill in their answers. But those enumerators are now supposed to answer, put the answers down that a person tells them, whereas uh, in 1940, quite frequently for many of the questions, the numerators were encouraged to make judgments and to make their, to, to kind of decide for themselves what was happening. And so, so I'm gonna take this now in two directions and I'm gonna wrap up my comment because uh, one of them is a little bit of an earlier conversation that we were having. Um, but I think it's important to note, sometimes we think about like the state producing big categories and and things that then cross identities and then individuals making choices about who they are. And I guess one of the things that is most important to me in the book is to recognize how many of our identities and ways in which we are come to know one another are much more locally social. And so for instance, I've got a chapter about this, this category of the partner. And I look at how in different places in New York, in Hawaii, in San Francisco, people get identified as partners. And we, we often don't know what it means for a person to be a partner. What we know is this kind of relational encounter 
in which a person and an enumerator showed up. An enumerator wrote down partner, saying this person is partner to the other person in their household. And, and for me, it's, it's not that important. It's, it's really important, of course, what each individual said, but I can't figure out what that is. Instead, all I know is that these people in this particular setting settled on this as a viable category. And one of the findings is that in queer communities, people are more likely to identify as partners, which doesn't mean that they were in what we would today call queer relationships. So they were queer in a sense that they broke heteronormative norms of the time, uh, but they but they they constructed these, these kind of social identities together. And then much of what identity work is and why we need to look at the, the doorstep data is because from place to place, time to time, social norms at local levels are shaping who we are to ourselves and to one another. And so, so that's like one part of the story. The other part of the story, how things have changed then, is now so your, your census forms are supposed to be your own self-identification. But it's not like everything else has gone away. So, uh, so we're still identifying ourselves in our local identification and in like these larger political structures. And so my friend, uh, who's a, a very savvy census operator, she, when she fills out the race categories, she does this careful calculus. It's her, her mother is black Jamaican, or no, sorry, black Haitian. Uh, and her father it would be classified according to the census as Asian Indian. And so she has, she has the right to check both of those boxes. But again, being a very savvy operator, she recognizes that if she does that in many tabulations, she'll show up then under a two or more races category, just all like bunched together. And so she doesn't want her, uh, both of these groups then to essentially lose their representation on all of those tabulations later on. So instead she strategically chooses one or the other. And so she, in 2020 census, she was she identified solely as African-American or black, precisely so that one group Will, will definitely get her and will have her count in their count. She'll count for them instead of being lost. Uh, and so, so like things have changed, but we still, we still have these very complicated calculuses that we have to think through. And of course, most people don't think through them. And instead there's, so the, the data we get, the result of impromptu choices There's some questions coming in in the Q and A, so I do want to make time for that, but I didn't want to not allow you to respond if you wanted to. No, I think that's beautifully put, and I love this sort of thinking about this as a strategic calculus. If one knows about this, I mean, for my own purposes, I, I sort of refuse to be classified as white and <laughs> typically fill out the other. Um, but I mean, this is you know, but. That's and that's the kind of story that you know, I have told myself and sort of strategic resistance, but knowing that there's consequences of that. Um, but I'd love to get to the QA. Let's do it. So we I encourage everyone to continue to drop questions in the QA, but I'll start off uh, with a question that comes in from Catherine Morris. And I'll uh, it's directed to you, Dan. What 1940 census question did you find most rich and fascinating? And what stories did it reveal? I know there's one about the presence of radios in U.S. households, which I've been puzzling about. Yeah, um, the 1940, so the, the radio question, I think introduced in 1930 to begin with, uh, and was at that point quite contentious. Um, so it, one of the surprising things is that there's a lot of census poetry, like much more poetry about the census than you could possibly have anticipated otherwise. Uh, often because like people just write poems, satirical poems, and send them to the Census Bureau, uh, usually again in protest or in annoyance. So in this case, the, for 1930 census, there was a Manhattan woman who was annoyed about the fact that they were asking about the radio in her household. And so she wrote a poem about how annoyed she was about the radio question and sent it in there. Um, but the radio question in 1940 would show up uh, in the context of the housing census. So the 1940 census is the first time at which a special census of housing was first introduced, um, and and that and that right that's a that's another part of this larger story, which is I see the 1940 census as crucial to seeing the 
the US government shift towards suddenly being much more concerned about economic management and about thinking about the economic lives of all of its citizens. So the housing census is there in part because the people want to have a sense of whether FDR is right when he says that a third of all people live uh, in substandard homes. And because they're also particularly interested in trying to stimulate home building as a way of getting out of the depression, right? Because it's important to remember that in 1940, as people are going door to door, this is still really the, it's, there's been some ups and downs, but it's still a very depressed moment in American economic, and economic lives. And people are, are really struggling. Uh, I think my question for 1940, and I'll leave some of this for the, for the book. Um, you, can, you can read more in the book, but um, it would be either the relationship category uh, which is really interesting to me. And I, I talked a little bit about how then the, the partner was particularly a category in a way in which I could kind of think about some of the, the reasons that the partner, that the relationship category was interpreted. It's really strange. So like people wanted to get rid of the relationship category. And one of the reasons, one of the primary reasons it still was left in the census in the early 20th century was to prevent fraud. Because they believed, folks in the Census Bureau believed that enumerators, if they had to make up plausible relationships, would be less good at that than at other things. And so it'd be easier to catch people just making up random people, a process called padding, if they had to also provide viable family relationships. Of course, then the, the trick, thinking about this in terms of like living in a queer household, is that queer households don't look like normal households and therefore are much more likely to look like fraudulent households or to look like people that are like, uh, that don't otherwise quite fit. And so the relationship category, the other one I'll just throw out there is that this income question is incredibly contentious. And so for me, I loved the chance to investigate in the, in the, the granular census records and try to see how did people show their resistance? How do people who I know didn't like the income question register that resistance? How did they avoid answering it or find ways to, or did they avoid answering it? Or did they, as Alex alluded to earlier, sometimes say like, I can't believe that I'm supposed to tell this to the Census Bureau. Dear Senator, here, I don't want anyone to know that I make $262 a year, which of course now everyone knows because I put in my book uh, because they wrote it to their senator. So it turns out it's the best way possible to, to broadcast your income to the world uh, 80 years later is to write to your senator and tell it to them. All right, that's all. <laughs> Thank you for that. Honestly, uh, your answer just now is starting to answer one of the questions that came up in the um, Q&A. And so I'm going to read, it's a long question, but you're going to hear all of it and know exactly how to answer. I trust you <laughs> to do that. Okay. There's growing awareness around data privacy and the ways in which our personal data can be exploited by corporations, the government, and our bad actors. In the same way that the Dowds refused to share their income in 1940, do you see more people refusing to answer questions on the census for fear that it might be used against them or simply because it's safer not to share? Similar to what you were just talking about. Over time, would that result in an increasingly less trustworthy census? And what impact would that have on resource allocations, investments, et cetera? We've come across uh, changes that the census has made to address these concerns. That would also be super interesting to hear about as well. Okay, so there's an empirical question there about whether or not the census is in fact kind of has over time become less trustworthy in terms of what people are revealing. And my answer to that is, I have no idea. And I definitely shouldn't answer that because if I were to do so, it would be entirely inappropriate because I don't have any empirical data to give. I can give some context though, which is to say that the undercount is significantly less than it was in 1940. So people are being counted better. And the other kind of shift that's happened is that most people aren't answering the question about their income anymore. So the 1940 is the introduction of probabilistic sampling. I talk about this as like letting the casino into the census. And, and what that allows is that now the Census Bureau uses the decennial census asking just these seven questions to create a full map of everybody in the probabilistic terms, it would be like the urn of the entire nation. And then like they pick balls out of that urn to decide uh, every year through something called the American Community Survey, who to ask these questions of. And so many fewer people are asked these questions for probabilistic sampling that are much more invasive questions. 
part of that being the theory that if people are, are at, fewer people are asked these questions less frequently, they're maybe more likely to be willing to participate than having this have asking everybody of this. Also, because Congress got very annoyed about this in the 1970s and started to make a real fuss about the census being a deep, deep invasion of privacy. Not everybody in Congress, but enough people in Congress that it became um, useful for the Census Bureau to, to, to kind of devote more resources to sampling and finding ways to ask fewer questions of most individuals over time. Uh, the other tiny thing I'll add to that is it's interesting to think about like why it is that the Census Bureau keeps individual data confidential over time. Um, and one of, one of them certainly is to encourage people to be able to, to tell things honestly. But even there, I've been researching this over the last few months that um, like one, one of the initial reasons that the Census Bureau was insisting on confidentiality in the middle of the 20th century was precisely because they knew that their data was not perfect. They knew that like people faced people and businesses faced with a census question often kind of had to like shoehorn themselves in in a way that they didn't wouldn't want to be represented publicly or in any like high stakes thing in a court for instance so one reason confidentiality exists i think is so that we can compromise so we can like make ourselves known in a timely fashion to the nation in a way that's good enough for the purpose of statistics but that we wouldn't actually want to be understood of as ourselves individually, which again, I think is a useful thing for people, for those of us who want to find individual stories in census in the past, to know that the individual stories we're finding are an enumerator's recording of a person as they allowed themselves to be seen to that enumerator at a particular moment. It's not who they are. There's a much deeper sense of who they are that's, that's lost to us, but it's something, something that's there. And I, I just want to interject here too, just thinking about this too. Um, and, and it's sort of something I think the book highlights well and provides context for, but also is, is still very relevant today, is that the kind of refusals to answer came, I think, both from very privileged people and also very marginalized people. And so the kind of resistance of, uh, you know, many people not wanting to answer who actually made more than $5,000 a year in, in wages. Um, so that is coming in. And I have a friend who's a census enumerator, who was a census enumerator in, in 2020, and was saying actually a lot of resistance in, 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 in her anecdotal uh, experience was coming from, you know, actually people living in very conservative, you know, kind of small C conservative areas of small government, not wanting to give information maybe with, with uh, upper middle class incomes. And then the other side of that is, of course, you know, we'd be remiss if we weren't talking about the census information and, 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 and its use in Japanese internment and the way, and the way that that had been uh, overtly a tool. And, 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 and those, of course, have been, um, you know those fears have been reiterated with the with the with the citizenship question and 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 under under uh, Trump and and Secretary Ross etc. So yeah, these things have still persisted on, and you know there have been guarantees, but you know at the same time, you know the it's still the state having a history of doing such things, proven or proven for for. For Japanese Americans and and not proven, I guess, for upper you know upper class, over overwhelmingly white conservative people. I want to um, try to squeeze in at least one more question, um, and both of you will be able to address this. Can we talk a little more about doing data history? What does it look like as a historiographical method? What does it allow us to say as historians of data and what might it obscure? Dan, you can jump in first. Um, what's it look like? So it looks like, some, some of that looks like uh, very, very old fashioned um, historiographical methods. I spent a lot of time wandering into the National Archives and getting my my nice boxes and opening them and taking pictures and reading through and creating large PDFs and the sort of thing. 
Uh, one of the things that was different about this kind of work, and I'm not gonna ask the question fully, um, but one of the things that was interesting was, I, I needed to spend a lot of time reading a lot of census sheets and just absorbing and trying and generating questions. And, and sometimes that would happen uh, because in this, for this book I experimented, I ran a blog, censusstories.us while I was writing it. And from that, from, from publish, publishing a little bit of work as I was working, I got new questions. People asked me questions with them about things that they'd seen in censuses and then I could investigate that and that helped me to kind of snowball and figure out what kind of questions asked about a data set. Uh, but then the other thing is I have, I have a history lab uh, at Colgate and then also supported by Data and Society with Stone Foundation funding. Uh, which, are, which is a handful of people. I think Kevin's in the talk. Hi, Kevin. Um, and, uh, and and I needed a team. I, I liked having a team too. It was fun to have people to work with who would who could wander through just hundreds and hundreds of sheets, sometimes counting and tallying things, sometimes just looking for an anomalies, uh, sometimes like taking a, a data set. So I went to Dartmouth and got all of the letters written, many of the letters written to the Senator Charles Toby, who was uh, against the income question. And then we went into the census records and tried to find as many of these letter writers as we could to see what they said and what they did in the census. And that was enormously time consuming work. Uh, and I relied a great deal on the insights and work of, uh, of my census lab or my uh, history lab. Alex? Yeah, just a, just a last word so we can conclude. Um, you know, I, I'm not a trained historian. I I, I would love to, to be one, <laughs> but I, I'm not. Um, I, I take a lot of inspiration from historians. Um, I do think that there are folks who do some really great work and sort of thinking about what this work of, of kind of reading a data set looks like. Uh, I'm gonna call out um, Lindsay Poirier, um, who has done some amazing work. And one article, I think, um, that she's written on teaching and getting students um, involved is called is ethnographies of data sets and is how to do critical analysis when you're having the data. Um, and I dropped it in the chat and I and and so oh I don't think it went to everybody. Let me um, I think Rika can share. Sorry, <laughs> um, but it it was sort of a way of interrogating this both in terms of doing this from a quant perspective, but also. Um, how to how to take a step back and read it more as a text. So um, just want to give a shout out and yeah, <laughs> as Ria says, squad up, get some people and students, you know, getting students and folks involved, really great maneuver. Thank you for that. Dan, I want to turn it back over to you to give us final words on democracy's data. Okay, so uh... Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Alex, for showing up. Thank you, Rente, for, uh, for guiding us through and asking these questions. Thank you for everyone else who's been here with us. Thank you, Rigo, for uh, taking all the things we say and then translating them into links that people can use to actually find these wonderful resources. Uh, I want to close with uh, probably a, a um, inappropriately upbeat note. Um, but I'm just going to do this uh, because I like to sing. So I'm going to sing you a song. The tune will be familiar to some of you, um, especially if you grew up in upstate New York. The tune is the Erie Canal song. And here we go. <clears throat> I've got a book printed on mashed up tree. It's democracy's data published by MCT. I've got a book printed on pulped up wood. It's a book, it's a look at bureaucratic personhood. A book about the census might sound boring, filled with numbers far from stirring. But about this story, well, I must sing of data, democracy, and dignity. Census, everybody counts. Census, so the nation sees itself, and you'll maybe find your neighbor or an ancestral pal in the lingering traces of a datafied pal. I love thank it. You. I love it. Uh, thank you for joining us <laughs> for today's book talk. And thank you, Dan and Alex, for a wonderful discussion. Democracy's Data launches on August 23rd. I encourage you to pre-order the book. Um, 
Data and Society's book form series provides a platform for scholars and researchers to present their work, frame key debates in the field, and gather feedback from a peer network of thinkers and practitioners. For future programs and opportunities, make sure to sign up for our newsletter. Have a wonderful day. Thank you so much.